The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Capital Preferences, ACN 662-118-710, ABN 58662-118-710, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Dean Holmes from the Wealth Network, and welcome to this podcast series where we discuss the different preferences that clients may have and how by understanding these, advisors can gain deeper client insights, helping them to provide better advice. Capital Preferences sponsored this podcast to bring you stories of advisors as light bulb moment makers. Their interactive research-backed client experiences give advisors the richest, most reliable understanding of their clients. With revealed preference technology, you can see tomorrow first and be the trusted sense maker clients choose again and again. 2,000 advisors are already using Capital Preferences with 400,000 clients around the globe and it's now available in Australia. Join them. Welcome to episode one of Revealed Preferences, the key to deeper client understanding and better advice. Today, we're going to talk about revealed preference methods and how to use them to really get to know your clients and make better, more informed decisions with them. These methods are relatively new to the advice space. They're a novel tool for understanding your clients. So today, I'm joined by Simon Camus of Wealth Advisors and Dr. Shakar Kariv, Professor of Economics at the University of California, Berkeley. Shakar is going to get into the economics and research that sit behind these methods, and Simon will get into how to use these methods with clients. Simon, over to you to get us started with an introduction to yourself, your business, and what you're excited about today. Hi, guys. I'm Simon Camus. I run my own little firm, Wealthier out of Geelong and Melbourne, and um, I came onto Capital Preferences recently, and I'm really excited to, I suppose, be an advocate and, sh- and s- explain to you guys at a coalface level how um, this tool is really revolutionizing my client experience. Excellent. Thank you. And and Shahar, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, your journey, uh, your accents, and then most importantly, uh, how dolphins uh, can make its way into this podcast. I'm really excited about that. All right. So I'm Shahal, and uh, don't try to pronounce my name correctly. Even I cannot pronounce my <laughs> name correctly anymore. And uh, I'm uh, I'm an economics professor at uh, UC Berkeley, and I've been at Berkeley uh, for 20 years. Time flies when you are having fun. Um, and I'm a decision theorist and a game theorist by training. And, you know, uh, let me tell you uh, what economics is all about. So economics is all about improving people's well-being. Okay. Interesting take. Economics is all about improving people's well-being. That's not how I think most people usually think about it. It's more interest rates, investments, and so on. Can you explain that a little bit more, Shakar? Economics is not about setting the interest rates. You know, uh, it's bigger than this. Uh, You think to yourself that if the central bank is setting the interest rates correctly, then you can improve the well-being of many, many people. Now, you know, when I'm saying well-being, this is not something precisely defined because your well-being depends on many, many things. It depends on your mental well-being. It depends on your physical well-being, but also... And over the years, increasingly so, it actually depends on your financial well-being. We have a lot of research to show that financial well-beings takes a larger and larger part of overall well-being. And the reason is actually simple. Take a 200-year perspective. Suppose that you were the richest person on earth 200 years ago, and you had a problem in your tooth. What did they do? They pulled it out because money could not buy dental care. And today, so many problems can be solved by throwing money at them, sometimes even little money. 
So I actually see Simon and your fellow financial advisors as the boots on the ground for improving people's well-being. And I say, and I mean it, that my financial advisor is more important for my well-being than my physician. But together with this statement actually comes a lot of responsibility because I'm holding you guys to the same standards that I'm actually holding physicians and other providers of medical care. You are that important. And because you are that important, the purpose of capital preferences and, you know, the purpose of my entire research in some sense, the applied purpose of it was to provide you guys tool, diagnostic tools that you can do your very, very important job better, right? So we can dive in. What are the diagnostic tools? And uh, part of this explanation is going to be the, the famous dolphin explanation. But let, let me take another minute uh, before I get to the, to the famous dolphin story. Everyone loves dolphins, of course. Okay, Shikar. So we've explored how financial advisors and physicians are similar, but there must be a limit to that metaphor or a difference. So how are the two different? How are financial advisors and physicians different? All right. So there is a big difference between a financial advisor and a physician. What's the difference? The difference is medicine is a hard science and economics with all my love and respect to my profession is not a hard science. You know, we don't have microscopes. We don't have hardware. We have software. So when you come to your physician, it is pretty clear what the physician needs to, to do in order to know the patient. You know, give me the patient age, gender, medical history. What the physician needs to do is pretty clear. And then the physician can say, I know this patient. And by the way, you go to different physicians, they will do exactly the same, right? They will take a blood test sample. They will check your cholesterol and so on and so forth. But everything that they do, look, the physician will ask you, how do you feel today? But this is just to be nice. You know, my grandmother, I took her to the physician every day. Every time she told him, I'm going to die. Eventually she was right, but it was <laughs> 40 years. So <laughs> it's hard to rely on what people are saying. And the physicians are actually, they believe what they get from the microscope, from the blood sample, from the x-ray, because they have hardware. In economics... We don't have hardware. We only have software. So for us, we first need to, A, define what does it mean for an advisor to know the client. You know, if uh, one thing that you learn in academia, you don't learn many things in academia, but one thing that you learn, you really don't learn many things. Uh, you learn some things very well, but you don't learn many things. There is a difference here. But the things that you learn very well is that the most difficult part of actually answering the question is making the question well-defined. Because if the question is well not well-defined, there is no way of actually answering the question. So the question that I basically pose here is, what do we mean? What the financial advisor actually need to know? Then we would say he knows the client. And by what means can the financial advisor uh, actually get this information given that, you know, we don't have an X-ray into the client financial personality. You know, this is uh, impossible. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm Simon's client. I'm coming to Simon and I tell Simon, Simon, help me. But in order to help me, he needs to know, know me. What does it mean even knowing me? So now we can actually start and get to the Dolphins example. Because the standard technique for a financial advisor to know the client is what we economists call stated preferences. I basically ask the client questions and the client gives me answer. This is why we call it stated preferences, because the client is telling us. So uh, this is done using surveys or questionnaires. And let me say that economists in principle we are very averse to questionnaires. You might actually be able to ask objective information like how old you are. I'm already in the age that I might lie or I might actually <laughs> forget. Uh, 
Um, but you know, so you might actually ask for objective information, but subjective information is very hard. So let me give you an example of subjective information. So I'm going to ask you the million dollar question. Tell me how much do you like dolphins from one to 10? This is a very standard, very easy survey question. One, I hate dolphins. Hell, I love mo dolphins more than anything else. So I ask this question and many, many, many people, and no person ever told me, Shachar, I'm sorry, I cannot answer this question, it's not well defined. What do you mean like a dolphin? It's not something, can you be more specific? No one is actually answering like this. Everyone is giving me a number, six, seven, sometimes eight, sometimes even more. Then I'm asking the second question, on the same scale, how much do you like sharks? So you see, immediately there is an order effect. And out of the hundreds of people that I asked, I think only few told me that they like sharks more than dolphins. Mm. So you get a typical answer for dolphins is eight, for sharks is six, four, or even less. It's interesting what Australians feel about sharks, but you know, let's let's we can do another podcast maybe on this. But of course, you see now that there are order effects here. The fact that I asked you first on dolphins and then on sharks, but no matter what the answers are, then my next question is always, okay, so I understand that you like dolphins and you virtually also like sharks, but less than dolphins. The person says, yes, that's correct. And then I say, you know what? Let's suppose that I had information to your tax statements or your credit cards. How much money have you ever invested in dolphins? We, there are a variety of charities that all the money goes to dolphins. How much money you invested in this? And the typical answer is zero. And how much money you ever invested in sharks? The typical answer is also zero. So your stated preferences is that you really like dolphins and you also like sharks, but your revealed preferences from your actions is that you could not care less about dolphins and equally you cannot care less about sharks. There is basically a complete disconnect between the stated preferences that we say in surveys to the revealed preferences that we see in the real world. All right. This is about dolphins and sharks. That's easy. But when I ask you your stated preferences about your risk attitudes, which is something much more abstract than dolphins and sharks, the differences can even be bigger. Right? Indeed. So, so this yeah. is where it's, our journey begins. Simon, have you ever surveyed anyone about dolphins in any anything like that? No, but I, I must admit I've invested a fair bit in Flake, uh, which is uh, eaten at fish and chip shops near near where I live. So, well, that probably shark, isn't it? Rating high on shark <laughs> there. But... High, high in shark. Now, Shakar, can you go into the survey a little bit here? Because I know it's quite common for financial advisors to use surveys with their clients to understand their risk tolerance. You know, we have to understand that the main problem with surveys is that um, you know there are people that have experience with surveys. However, surveys, there is no mathematical theory to write a survey. So for example, if the three of us now wants to write a survey, we can debate forever which questions to ask, how many answers there should be to every question, and what's the order of these questions. Now, Maybe based on experience, some of us will have how to do it right. But there is never a theory. This is the right survey. When we move to revealed preferences, there are years of years, the founding fathers of microeconomics, that on their high shoulders I stand, they can tell us when we move to revealed preferences, they can tell us what data we need and whether we have enough data to measure preferences with enough precision. All right. Now, you know, there are two types of data on revealed preferences. One type of data, which we always prefer, is called naturally occurring data. This is data that comes from transactions that you actually do in your everyday life. The power of Amazon, the power of Amazon is good naturally occurring data. Why? Because on Amazon, you buy consumption goods and you do it very frequently. So look, Amazon, just by looking at my past behavior, Amazon knows that I have a large dog 
or maybe I have many, many small ones. <laughs> but, uh, no, because, because I'm buying enough dog food. Now, Amazon, using machine learning, already knows that people that have large dogs, they also like the outdoors, because otherwise, who takes a large dog? You need, you need to take with the large dog outside, right? Maybe take a chihuahua if you don't want to go outside. But don't take a large dog. So Amazon can figure out my preferences for consumption goods just based on my best behavior because they have very frequent data. But for us, it's exactly the opposite. We actually tell clients, you have to stick to a portfolio. So you actually do it. You buy and sell financial good not that often. So we don't have naturally occurring data. So when we don't have naturally occurring data, what are we using? We are using what we call experimental data. This is not a survey. I'm not going to ask you a question. I'm going to give you a gamified environment. In this gamified environment, you are going to solve trade-offs. And from these trade-offs, I will use economic theory to uncover your preferences that are the three preferences that are important for investing. So we've got some, uh, we've got this first element of the context for what we're going to go through today, which is this difference between stated preferences, I like dolphins, and then revealed preferences is in my past performance, I've done something or nothing towards my love of dolphins. And so in your research and what happens next, we we've learned about, or we know about these three categories of trade-offs. Can you tell us a little bit about the three categories of trade-offs and how that's starting to work towards our revealed preferences? The first one is risk preferences, of course. Do they put my money in bonds or stocks? That we know. The second one is time preferences, today versus tomorrow. Should I buy this Tesla or save more for my retirement? Or should I eat this cheesecake or eat the salad? It's exactly the same time preferences. Do I do something that is better for me today or something that will be better for me in the future? Do I go to the gym after we finish the podcast or do I watch another reality show? Uh, that's also time preferences. And finally, there is what we call social preferences. It's the preferences between my own well-being and the well-being of other people. How much money do I want to leave to my kids? Do I want to send my kids to college? How do I allocate my money among my kids? So these are the three types of preferences. Risk, time, social. And because we don't have, you don't buy and sell your portfolios every time, uh, we need to have alternative data to reveal your preferences. And these are the games that actually capital preferences based on my research is offering for financial advisors. And the game, the games are a series of que series of questionnaires, but not in the context of, of would you like to grow your wealth? It's the trade-off game. Exactly. And so Simon, tell us a little bit about how you've done this profiling in the past. So just what was, what was the history of how, bad was it in terms of you doing a profile on a, on a client? Like what's the worst possible venture? And then how are you positioning it today in terms of the conversations that you can have with a client as a result of using, using this revealed preferences process instead of stated preferences? Yeah. Well, I think most people listening to this podcast will, will be uh, familiar with the licensee risk profiler that has maybe 12 questions, maybe more. And the jargon that's littered through these questionnaires, you couldn't possibly send it to a client cold and expect them to have you know, a reasonable good go at it and understand what's going on. So there would often be a lot of coaching around it. And I, I guess thinking back, the problem with that is you're nudging potentially clients based on your own biases. And often the questions just weren't really uh, tangible. So we would end up with a number which would equate to a risk profile. Uh, clients would go into a nice little box and we'd move on and possibly we'd do that year after year and it would be, feel like a chore because clients would get to this point of the re review meeting and go, oh, we have to do that again. So having changed licensees recently, kind of getting a chance to reset the tools being used, um, capital preferences came along and what I loved about it was 
I don't think you could design a simpler uh, tool for a client to use. So uh, the way I'm prefacing it is it's a preferences exercise. So I don't really kind of use the word risk because uh, in my view, it's a, it's kind of more than risk. It's capacity and it's other elements come into it as well, like timeframes. Uh, and it's worked best for me, uh, I think, where I've done it with the client because they might turn to me and go, well, what does this mean? I'll say, it's just asking you in a short and binary short period of time whether you would risk X amount to potentially make Y. Um, and yeah, after we get through the first question and the next five, they're, they're speeding up, they're, they're really enjoying it. And like you said, I think it's almost fun for some of them by the end. In fact, it, it is. So that's kind of how uh, I found it. And the engagement's been really good across all sort of generations that have been yep. doing it with. And I think it also allows for a better conversation between couples as well, Simon, just in terms of the the, the potentially the sophistication of each other and, and the, the natural bias towards I'll have what she's having kind of exercise is that then you're able to get two versions of the of the actual revealed preferences which could be different to one another and most likely should be different to one another oh i'd say more often than not it's surprisingly so yeah it's and it's great then the, just deepens the conversation like you said because uh we start to get to the root of what's really important about money to these people as we delve into this so which is great absolutely so shaka i i like the concept that you're talking about about the experimental data that you that Amazon obviously gets real data in terms of your preferences towards your your dog choice. Uh, the other thing that we know we know and get data on as financial advisors is we see the the buying and selling activities on the stock market in and around falls. So we we see these flows of money coming in and out of the best performing share fund gets most of the money late after the best performance, the stock market falls, all retail investors uh, sell out at that point in time. So not that they've done their own uh, questionnaire, all of these people, but what can we learn from that That actual real evidence? Is that part of what has driven your research? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, selling when markets go down, it's a sign of, uh, it's, sign of it's a sign of what we call loss aversion. And, you know, I always say that the most challenging client is a client that actually has high levels of risk tolerance, but he's averse to losses. So this client, when he comes to you and say, yes, give me the aggressive portfolio, I can digest it. But when markets go down, his loss of aversion kicks in and then he sells. By the way, uh, it's exactly like me with cheesecakes. You know, I eat them and then I... <laughs> so what our method can actually do, I can really identify the clients on a spectrum of risk tolerance and loss aversion in a way that is very efficient and very quick. And then, for example, let's suppose markets are volatile and going down, I can provide Simon with a list. Call these people first. Because, you know, someone who is, for example, is risk averse to begin with is not going to be in an aggressive portfolio. Yes. So we will have less of a down. Here is exact, this is an example that our method not only helps you to actually map preferences or people to products, which I want to say and actually something else that Simon, um, following on what Simon said, we can also... Uh, help the advisor with the hand holding because <laughs> an advisor job is not just uh, sending uh, sending the, the the client to a portfolio. It's also holding this portfolio when you need to. So there is a lot of hand holding. You know, uh, my physician always tells me, Shafar, you need to exercise, but you need to follow up with me that I exercise, that I yes. actually exercise. Yeah. All right. So, um. Following up on what on the on the great point that Simon um, uh, put forward, uh, mapping from a risk level of a questionnaire to a product, there is no mathematical mapping like this. There, there is just there is no way. You did this in a questionnaire, then you need the moderate portfolio based on what? 
when you do our experiment, we are actually estimating what is called the utility function. There is a real mathematical parameter there. And this mathematical parameter is basically saying how you weigh expected return and volatility. Because the efficient frontier is exactly this, right? Higher expected return, but higher volatility. So based on this mathematical parameter, I can map you mathematically, really mathematically, to a point on the efficient frontier. Now, what happens if there is a couple? We are not going into marriage counseling, uh, but, you know, part of being a financial advisor is actually marriage Absolutely. counseling. Mm. We are going to do the marriage counseling under the hood, meaning one, one person in the household and another person in the household will play the game. And underneath a game theory, will actually find a compromise and will explain here is a compromise between your different, let's say, risk attitude, risk tolerance, risk capacity, and why, why this is actually the mapping. Let me say that we currently use it with advisors, with actually two household members, but you can actually think about a family fund that actually there are even more than two people that are controlling the fund. Sometimes the kids are involved. Sometimes it can be money that was inherited. And then there is multiple households there. So we can exactly find this compromise. And the compromise is going to be a mathematical compromise between the risk attitudes of everyone. You know, sometimes I must say, I compare financial advisors to pilots in the 1950s. You know, in the 1950s, on airliner, there were two pilots, a navigator and a flight engineer. Mm. Why? Because there was no equipment. So you really had to sit like this and all and fly the plane, go up, go down, fine. What we do, we are trying to equip the cockpit of the financial advisor with the most advanced tools in game theory and decision theory. It doesn't mean at all that the financial advisor can be replaced by the automatic pilot. It cannot. However, it can make the life of the financial advisor much easier, much simpler, and more efficient, such that the human being and the mind will be invested on what the human being and the mind should be invested, and not in flying the plane like this and holding it. So the different things, so you've got this data set, and obviously we're testing this over time, but our clients are getting older as well, and they're having different responses to the external world as well. So the amount of financial information that's available now versus the 50s has expl- has exploded. Uh, we're obviously getting older. We could say generally we're wealthier and better educated, and that obviously changes over time as well. Do these things have an impact on my preferences over time? So first... You know, decisions, decisions actually based on three things. They based on your preferences, but they also based on your constraints and they also based on your goals. And all of these things are changing over time. By the way, let's start with preferences. There is a lot of evidence that when people are going older, they are actually becoming more loss averse, which I say It's exactly right, because think about it. If you make a terrible financial decisions in your 20s, you know, it's on a small amount of money and you have time to recover. So, you know, no big deal. But if you make a terrible financial decision just after retirement, there is no way to recover and it's on a large amount of money. So actually people should be more loss averse because they have more money and, you know, they cannot recover if they make Mm. a mistake or markets go down. So definitely, uh, preferences are changing, even without more information. It's just because of the circumstances, okay? And we definitely need to keep track of how preferences are changing. But also, other things are changing. You know, constraints are changing because there are different finance. And, you know, it used to be that we were all on defined benefit pension plans. You know, one of the advantages of defined benefit pension plans was that all the risk and all the changes were on the institution. But now it's on me. So, of course, my constraints are changing over time. And finally, also my goals. You know, now 
I think that I will be skiing and snowboarding until my 80s. So I want to buy a cabin in a ski resort, but maybe I will reach my 60s and I see that I want to play bridge. So, okay, <laughs> then I will need to reverse everything. Right. This will never happen to me, the bridge, but never mind. It's an example. Well, don't say never. I've, got, I've had lots of clients move into the bridge phase and it uh, surprised me. One of my clients learned Spanish so that her goal was not only uh, to play bridge, but to learn Spanish. So then she went to Spain to play bridge in Spain. So that's obviously two levels of complexity there uh, in terms of uh, playing playing bridge as well. So Simon, how do you think you would use the the process as and when clients are going through different stages? Um, and how you how would you flow that into part of your client reviews and things like that? Definitely. Well, I mean, because uh, things can change a lot in twelve months. If you're working an annual review sort of cycle, it's really logical to bring this up as part of the agenda. And in fact, I do. Yeah, it's. It's, uh, it's something early on because if we don't have this discussion towards the start of the review, then the discussion around portfolios and markets may not be right uh, and may not kind of suit the narrative of what the client needs. So um, I would have thought regularly, a bit like going to the doctor, but also um, when there's been a major change to circumstance because uh, that's particularly when the goals might be shifting. So loss of job, you know, cha- significant change of circumstances, There, that's when... Um, that's when you really want to wheel it out and go deep on it. My mm. So tell us a little bit about the the bucketing of preferences. So Simon, as I'll start with you. Like, what have we done in the past in terms of clients? You do a risk profile, then you try to get your clients to fall into multiple different buckets because they have multiple different goals. How have you navigated that in the past? And so I suppose then we'll have a conversation around how we can use the the tool and and the process going forward to make this better. Sure. Yeah. Well, the classic is, you know, someone saving for a house, yet they have long-term investments like super and other longer-term elements, but you usually just do one questionnaire, right? Because Mm. it's pretty hard for a person to answer the same set of 12 questions with a different hat on twice, uh, and it was lengthy. Um, So, yeah, commonly you would kind of invest the long-term money in a more aggressive approach and the shorter-term money less aggressively with a file note or something. It wasn't great. So... The great thing about this uh, cat preferences tool is that um, it only takes a few minutes to do to go through the exercise. So even yesterday, I ran through it with a 24-year-old girl saving for a property, but also has long-term money. So we just did it twice. So it was very easy because we scaled the exercise by the amount of money we had to invest in both scenarios. I just said, okay, let's do the first one based on your biggest priority, which is to buy a house. So naturally... She probably wasn't as willing to risk her capital built up for that purpose. Um, but then when we redo the exercise five minutes later for super and long-term investments, totally different story. Um, and the analysis that comes out at the end, it's really easy to kind of go talk about capacity, goal, constraints, preferences, um, and, it, and it just makes sense. And so that's the drop of the ocean of the revealed preferences, Shakar, like that Simon's job is to set the context and then you can drop into the detail. Absolutely. So, you know, it makes, so Simon's example, I actually think it's perfect. It really makes sense uh, for, let's suppose that I'm saving now money that I actually want to buy a house. It's for a down payment for two years. Uh, You know, here I have a very short horizon and, um, you know, getting a, getting a, a, a down payment is also what we call a threshold goal. If I go below the threshold, I cannot afford to buy the, the, the house that I want because I need to put 20% down. So this requires a completely different types of investing. Then I'm investing for 30 years. I'll just put the money there. It's not a threshold goal, right? It's something mm. for 30 years. And we worked very hard, and I'm very pleased that uh, Simon actually found it to basically set, because you know there, around every experimental game, there is framing such that the advisor can actually take the same tool, the same game, but frame it to different pots of money and, you know, different goals, buying a house or saving for retirement. It's very, very different. It has different preferences, different goals, and different constraints. Good. So that makes a lot of of sense. I think that'll make Simon's job uh, much easier as as well in terms of... uh, 
we've always said the bucket, this, this kind of concept of bucketing towards risk profiles and goals, but it leads a better conversation. And yes, if you can do it in a couple of minutes, Simon, instead of doing a third risk profile for the third investment portfolio, I think that that's going to work uh, quite well for us. So how's the game going to change in the future that you have? So at the moment, it's just risk, risk, return. But what other elements can you can we test our clients through this process to find out other things about them that we didn't know? All right. We have, uh, we have tons of verticals that we are doing. Uh, it's really the risk versus return is really the tip of the iceberg. Um, so uh, th the second one, let me go one by one. The second one is actually uh, about uh, what we call patience, time preferences, and present bias. Mm. And uh, let me give you a story. W what is actually happening underneath and what we actually want to uh, want to test? Let's suppose that you take a client and you ask the client, what do you prefer? $1,000 in a year or $1,100 in a year and one week? You see the trade-off? It's 52 weeks versus 53 weeks, 10% gains. I think that most clients will tell you, you know, I'll wait the extra week and let's go for the 1100 in 53 weeks, not even knowing what the interest rate is. Right. right. Now, let's take this trade off to the present and ask the client, what do you prefer? $1,000 now or $1,100 in a week? You see, it's just a week difference. But I took the trade-off and I brought it to now. There are people that will flip. We call it preference reversals. You know, when it's far away, they will say, we will wait an extra week for another $100. But when it's now, they will say, no, 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 give me the money. And, <laughs> you know, they will run to the store or run, or run to the bar. <laughs> uh, these people, we call them present bias. It's the people that this trade-off between something and something more in a week is changing when it's really close to them. We know that these people that, and of course, present bias can come with different degrees. We know that the people that have um, very high present bias, these are the people that you put them on a portfolio, but they will actually, it has nothing to do with market goes down. He will just pass next to the car dealership and he will buy a car that he didn't plan to buy in the morning and he doesn't need. Mm, got and it. in order to pay for the car, he will need to sell his portfolio. All right. So it's starting to, so this is, for example, it's just an example of things that you can actually get for time preferences. It's it's very interesting. And uh, the Australian example, which you, which you might appreciate, is that one of our largest superannuation funds, the name of the option, which is the default option, the name of the option is called balanced. And so I argue that the decision to name it balanced, even though it has 80% growth assets, it did two things. Obviously, it was default, so people stuck with the default, as you said there. But it kind of made people comfortable that yeah. they were in an in a portfolio that was appropriate. And I argue that because it was a 35-year time horizon, being in a balanced portfolio, but 80% growth actually was the is the right thing for them. But we needed to use this element of a, of a game around the language. Absolutely. And knowing that it's default to get people to be in the right portfolio. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that, that one decision has made Australians millions of dollars by being in the right risk profile at the right age. Yes. The problem is in the next phase is they don't know when their preferences have changed that that's no longer an appropriate Absolutely. portfolio for them. Absolutely. And given what we talked about, you basically need to have kind of a, a gliding path of reduced risk as as close you are to as closer you get to retirement. Mm. Um because from the reasons that we said that you don't, you know, it's a larger amount and you cannot recover. However, all gliding pain should actually go down, the risk. But, you know, mine can be different than Simon's and can be different from my wife's. So, you know, we, we need to find exactly the right path. And I think that this is a this is a major task for us to do in order to get people. You know, the issue is, the bottom line is, look, the issue is that life was simple. 
because we were all on defined benefit pension plans. We retired in our mid sixties and died in our mid and died in yes. our mid seventies. Problem solved. <laughs> We now, we want to retire even earlier. We live until our 90s. We want to have fun at the beginning of retirement. At the second part of retirement, we need to take care of our health. This is very expensive. Mm. So we need to take to get people to retirement that they have basically the balance. They have the financial means to do what they want. It's a very large part of life. Abs- absolutely. Simon, uh You'll obviously use this podcast with your with your clients, or maybe just this part that you're about to do. Uh, what questions do you have um, in terms of being able to use this for your clients? How it can work going forward? Let's have a soundbite for you to send to your clients as well. Well, reveal preferences is the way forward because uh, essentially the science behind it means that we can adjust your investments to match goals, preferences, and time. Uh, I'm going to find things about you that you don't even know yourself, that your partner doesn't know. Through this, we're going to have much better data to help manage your money going forward as life changes. Excellent. We understand it. This was great. I'm going to use this soundbite with my students. I'm teaching like 300 undergraduates this semester. (laughs) I'm going to play you and I should tell them, this is why you should listen to me. Excellent. (laughs) You can play the whole podcast if you'd like. The Ensemble podcast gets... We'll get some interesting listens uh, from the from the US, of course, as a as a result. So, Shikara, in closing, do you want to just summarize as a, as a as an academic would do about the what you see uh, in terms of what you're proud of, in terms of what you've helped to build, in terms of your lifetime of research, and then what what excites you going forward to to actually mean that you're not retiring next year. Uh, and that you'll be doing this for the next 20 years as well. Yes. So I think that, you know, as I said, what we have brought now to market, it's just the tip of the iceberg. And uh, we are going to continue until the entire, uh, I would say, uh, range of experimental games that we can bring to the market will change how we actually get people prepared uh, and uh, increase their financial well-being. And I think that no matter what, with all the machine learning and the artificial intelligence that we have, we will still need it. Mm. You know, I'll end with a short story that you can cut. Uh, I, uh, you know, I taught a course um with uh, a computer scientist, a very interesting computer scientist, one of the leaders of AI, and two philosophers. Uh, it's a joint course. It was it was painful at time when you bring people from the, it's like fusion food in academia, and you know fusion <laughs> food can be good or can be terrible. Yeah. So at time it was good, at time it was terrible. Uh, But, you know, um, we talked about the title of the course was Beneficial AI for Humans. And the computer scientists and the philosophers kept talking about self-driving cars. And I said, stop it. Self-driving cars is actually a simple problem. Maybe computationally it's difficult, but it's simple because preferences don't matter. You know, the self-driving car, it doesn't matter whether Shaffer is in the car or Simon is in the car. It basically needs to get us from A to B without killing ourselves from killing everyone else. And if I want to be like crazy, the self-driving car should say, Shaffer, we overrule you. And I kept saying, I want a piece of AI that will drive me to retirement. Well, this is difficult. Mm. Why? Because it depends on your preferences. So even in the future, you think that the cockpit of the financial advisor will have all the AI and all of this, which maybe it will. Still, to feed the beast, to feed the machine, you need to tell whether it's Shachar or Simon. So you need the machine to know my preferences, which the machine doesn't need to know if I drive a car. So I really think that this is a journey for the long run And with improvements of machine learning, AI, and data, this part of knowing the client's preferences and the financial advisor will only become more and more and more important. 
Excellent. I can't say anything else. If you if we're gonna we're going to finish the podcast with the financial advisor is is more and more important. Uh, we will all agree with that, Shakar. On that point, thank you so much for making the time. I My think pleasure, it's guys. still sunny, obviously, in California. So we appreciate the time zone, although it's worked us uh, for us very well. And Simon, thank you uh, for your time as well. And look forward to sharing the next uh, podcast in this series with the listener as well. Until then, have a great day.